today. And when he does, President Trump is hoping that he will look at Vietnam as a model for what his country could be, from enemy of the United States in economic isolation to friend and one of the fastest growing economies in the world. That is the pitch that President Trump is going to be making here in Hanoi, Ed. All right, Kristen Fisher starting us off live tonight. She'll be here with us on the ground in Hanoi all week. From Little Rocket Man to letters back and forth that had President Trump saying he and Chairman Kim, quote unquote, fell in love. The relationship between the two leaders has come, you might say, a long way. Elson Barber is live back at the White House where the president is. In fact, we may get tape from the president in a few moments. He's meeting with governors. Good evening, Elson. Good evening, Ed. Yeah, a lot can change over the course of a year. Take a listen to President Trump in the fall of 2017. North Korea best not make any more threats to the United States. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. But by the fall of 2018, President Trump was talking about North Korean leader Kim Jong-un in very different terms, saying at one point that they had fallen in love. And he went, as you said, Ed, from fire and fury, fire and fury to then talk of love, admiration, and also talk of a Nobel Peace Prize. President Trump mentioned that the prime minister of Japan had talked to him about that very thing. A lot can change over the course of a year, and a lot has changed when it comes to U.S.-North Korean relations in general. Let me walk you through some of the different things we've seen happen uh, since the mid-90s. There was the agreed framework of 1994. That fell apart in 2002. There was the six-party talks of 2003, which fell apart when North Korea tested their first nuclear device in 2006. The six-party talks that came back in 2007, but then ended in 2009. We can keep going here in 2012. There was the Leap Day deal. That ended after a few weeks with North Korea testing a ballistic mess missile. Uh, President Trump says this time things are different. Critics say they're not so short about that, but President Trump is adamant that under his leadership, his administration, things are finally going to turn around. Ed? All right. Elson Barber, live at the White House. Thanks for getting us through all that important context. Meanwhile, the president, Kim Jong-un, traveling great lengths, as we suggested, for this high-stakes summit right here in Vietnam. Chairman Kim left yesterday, riding about 2,000 miles or so from Pyongyang to Hanoi by train. That's about a third of the distance the President Trump will travel. He's expected to head out tomorrow on Air Force One, traveling 8,200 miles, some 20 hours in the air. Let's get straight now for more on the summit to retired four-star General Jack Keene. He, of course, is a Fox News senior strategic analyst. Good evening, General Keene. Yeah, good evening, Ned. I want to go through all these important issues with you, but I want to start with the breaking news from just an hour or so ago where the president of the United States said there's also going to be a summit in the days ahead with the Chinese president. Obviously, President Xi is critical, even though he's not here in Hanoi. China's role in these nuclear talks is so important. Oh, yeah, absolutely. When, when you're talking to North Koreans, you're actually talking to the Chinese as well. Listen, somebody's got to fix my earplug. I, I, I'm going to feedback in it. Sure. I hear my own voice. Okay. Well, well, General Keene, as you mentioned, uh, the Chinese uh, are critical to these talks. President Xi will be sitting down, we're told, uh, with President Trump uh, just in the next uh, couple of weeks. The president had tweeted a short time ago uh, that they're making progress uh, in terms of trade, big picture, and that specifically the president is going to delay uh, tariffs that were supposed to start increasing on Chinese imports on March 1st. So, General Keene, if you can hear me now, uh, or maybe... Uh, uh, we still have you there. Uh, I wonder what, how you believe China, uh, how important they really are to these talks. Well, they're, they're critical to the talks. I mean, they, they are a factor in North Korea's nuclear development and ballistic missile development. Some of the yeah. technology uh, for their ballistic mil missile development they got from the Chinese. Uh, Kim Jong-un, before he goes to a summit uh, with uh, President Trump, always makes certain that he has a trip to China. And China has yeah. eased, actually eased some of the sanctions on uh, North Korea. And uh, I'm a little frustrated that we're not taking a stronger step in, in doing something about it. But in, in, in actually yeah. looking at these talks, if I may, Ed, I mean, these, these talks sure. are, are colored by some, some really significant issues. One is, first of all, the personal diplomacy of head of states. That has not taken place before. And I know the administration from sources is surprised by the number of letters that Kim Jong-un has written to the president. 
And not only that, but the nature of the letters and how personal they are. One described mm -hmm. it almost like a father-son uh, relationship uh, that's communicated uh, between the two of them. So personal sure. diplomacy is a factor, and it's led to President Trump uh, speaking openly about the good relationship. The second thing is, while the, while the administration has not changed their objective of denuclearization, Ed, they clearly, in terms of a goal of doing this in two years, has changed. And they yeah. recognize now that 15 years to get a weapon, even longer to get ballistic mm -hmm. missiles, that the reality of doing it in two years is not realistic. And it, they're likely what we're going to see is a step-by-step -step reciprocal process going forward here. Sure. And the recognition that the administration knows that this is going to take much longer General. as we go forward. I have just about 30 seconds, so uh, tightly I want to try to say you've rightly give the president credit for some of these early steps, but you have also been clear-eyed about the fact that we are a stalemate on denuclearization. So in 30 seconds, what do you think would be a success here at, and in Hanoi? Well, any step forward. I mean, I don't think they're going to give us any ballistic missile or nuclear weapon. I don't even think they're going to give us an inventory of all of it, which we've been pressing. What they'll likely they'll give us is, an, is another facility, likely possibly their nuclear enrichment facility, as they did with two test facilities. And also maybe a step forward on ending the, the armistice and the Korean War, which I think would be mm -hmm. a major step in the right direction. All right. General Jack Keane. As he always does, bringing us some really intelligent conversation tonight. We appreciate you joining us. Good talking, Ed. All right. The president, as you may expect, is projecting a lot of confidence going into this week's sit-down or sit-downs. We'll see how long the meetings go. And is dismissing almost anyone, including people who worked in previous Democratic and Republican administrations who are offering advice. The president tweeting today, quote, so funny to watch people who have failed for years. They got nothing. Telling me how to negotiate with North Korea, but thanks anyway. As you can also probably expect, the mainstream media does not exactly have high expectations. There's this from the AP, the headline, Hanoi Summit Nightmare Scenario. Bad deals and little change. And here's a quote from it. Some experts fear the meeting could result in an ill-considered deal that allows North Korea to get everything it wants while giving up very little. The Washington Post, finally, the headline, No Rush, Trump Redefines Success, ahead of second summit with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. A quote in the piece, some fear that Trump could feel pressure to make a major concession to Kim during face-to-face -face talks, including a one-on-one -on -one session, in hopes of securing a reciprocal commitment he can herald as a political victory. So that's how the mainstream media is framing it. Let's go to two of our best. Joining me now, Jillian Turner, Fox News correspondent, all over national security issues, and Jonathan Wachtel, former colleague here at Fox, who's also the former communications director and spokesperson at the United Nations Mission to the United Nations. Good evening to both of you. Good evening, Ed. Good evening. Jillian... Jillian, I want to start with you first. Uh, what's your sense about our best guess tonight about what we can expect from this summit? So, Ed, a moment ago, you mentioned that the president has been sort of rejecting advice from former administrations. But I just want to point out for our viewers at home that the people he really has been taking advice from all the way leading up to this summit from weeks ago on a daily basis are his CIA director, Gina Haspel, the Director of National mm -hmm. Intelligence, Dan Coates, John Bolton, his National Security Advisor, and Daniel Pottinger, that's his uh, Senior Director for Asia on the National Security Council. Those groups of folks have been convening uh, with President Trump on a daily basis at the White House, I'm told. So they're the ones that are really forming the way he's looking at this trip. The foremost mm -hmm. advice that I am told they have been pressuring him about is to get a concrete concession out of Kim. I know that's not news to you, but they want him to agree uh, to open up at least one or more of his nuclear sites for inspections. Yeah, well, th that is important information you're adding uh, to this conversation. Young Blonde, uh, the nuclear facility, that is one that may be on the table in terms of potentially shutting it down. Uh, Jonathan, put a little meat on the bones there uh, in terms of uh, John Bolton, who Jillian rightly mentioned as National Security Advisor, critical here. He has said in recent days as well, look, uh, you know, there's an open door here for Kim Jong-un. The president can't force him through, but he's got him at the table, and there's a golden opportunity here for Kim Jong-un in terms of the economic uh, incentives he may get in the days ahead. Yeah, John Bolton is a great man to have in the negotiations uh, at this time, uh, given his history and understanding of the conflict. Uh, really an astute guy uh, and tough. And the North Koreans are, are very much aware of that and understand the, the strong 
uh, position that the United States uh, has going into this, and, and of course, uh, Ambassador Bolton and uh, you know, National Security Advisor Bolton has the president's ear, as Jillian mentioned. Uh, you know, it's, it's such a critical time for the North Koreans. This is an economy that is really not doing great. Uh, it's, it's a leader who really does need, uh, you know, Kim Jong-un, really does need some sort of win here. Uh, you know, he's taking this trip down uh, to Vietnam, traveling through China, in, in a way reminiscent of the trip that actually his grandfather took uh, just before the mm. outbreak of the uh, Vietnam War with the United States. An interesting optic uh, across the board, but makes him look like a real diplomat. Uh, as General Keane said, uh, the Chinese, of course, figure very large in these negotiations, though they're not taking part yeah. in the discussion. Let's face it, the Chinese sure. were at war with the United States in the Korean Peninsula. Yeah, and Jillian, following up on Jonathan's point about Kim Jong-un needing a victory here, one would be there was, of course, an armistice at the end of the Korean War, but it never officially ended. If he can get an official end to that and President Trump agrees to that, might it open the door to other concessions? It absolutely would. That for Kim, that is the, the big kahuna, just like for President Trump getting Kim to open up Yongbyon or another nuclear facility would be a really big deal. A lot of experts will tell you, though, Ed, that just the fact of President Trump taking the time and energy to travel overseas to meet face to face with Kim now for mm -hmm. the second time is in of itself a concession, is in of itself giving away the store, and that anything from here, you know, is an added bonus. They were they're expecting the president yeah. to walk out of this meeting with a signed, you know, certificate from Kim Jong Un saying, "I will do this and this and this." Barring that, it's a sure. failure because the president has really gone out on a limb. His his time, the leader of the free world's time, is perhaps the most precious commodity in sure. this in this country, and this is how he's choosing to spend it. Jonathan, I've got 30 seconds left. Uh, you worked with Ambassador Nikki Haley when she was at the U.N. Uh, how important is it for the U.S. and the president to take a hard line in terms of saying and sticking with what they've said, as Jillian points out, that you have to have denuclearization before we start lifting economic sanctions? You can't just do a little bit of denuclearization. You've got to really commit to it before we take the boot off the neck. You know, Ed, this conflict goes back to the 1940s, 1945 exactly, when the Soviets... Uh, took over the northern part of the country at the 38th parallel, uh, the peninsula, excuse me, in, in war with Japan. This is an mm -hmm. old conflict to make concessions uh, and think that you're going to be able to resolve this conflict very quickly, that denuclearization is going to happen overnight. These are rather unrealistic expectations. This is a long, methodical process. We do need to see some concrete steps taken here by both sides to show goodwill and to be moving this process along. But let's yep. not be under any false illusion. This is a very, very tangled and difficult Absolutely. negotiation. Difficult days ahead, but some important steps that have already been taken in Singapore. Now we'll see what happens in Hanoi. Jonathan, Jillian, appreciate you both joining us live tonight. Pleasure. You got it. All right. Our sp For speed but we're not removing the sanctions. And we're going to have, uh, I think, a very interesting two and a half days in Vietnam. And we have a chance for the total denuclearization. For decades, North Korea has been recognized as a rogue nation, often at odds with the rest of the world, on a number of big issues, especially, as the president suggested, nuclear armament. So joining us now from our New York studios, Asia analyst Gordon Chang. He's one of the best in the business. You know that. You see him on Fox a lot. He's the author of Nuclear Showdown, North Korea Takes on the World. Gordon, what do you think about what the president just said there about the possibility of denuclearization. What needs to happen here in Hanoi? Well, I think the two things we would like to see. First of all, I think the North Koreans need to declare all their missile and nuke facilities. We need to know what's there before we can disarm them. And the second thing is a timetable for disarmament. Now, many people say we're not going to get this this trip, but, you know, who knows? Um, they've got two very willful figures in President Trump and Kim Jong-un, and so we very well may get where we need to be. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting because this is happening in an important backdrop, a broader context here in Asia. And that's why we wanted to have you, because on the way over, I was reading this book, uh, The Future is Asian. And it talks about how 
uh, in terms of uh, uh, domestic product around the world, about half of it is in this Asian economic zone. It's where the real economic growth is happening. And it's no accident that Vietnam was chosen as this summit site, a nation, of course, racked by war, but now still a communist nation, of course, but with some economic reforms. The door's been open. People here have been perhaps thriving. Does that give incentive to Kim Jong-un after having been in Singapore a few months ago and seen the economic rise there to say, wait a second, there's a better path for him? I actually think the answer to that question is no. You know, we Americans would like to think it is. And President Trump during the Singapore summit last June actually had that video about what North Korea could become. We had President Trump's tweet a day ago about uh, a great future for North Korea. But the problem is the Kim family over seven decades has kept power by keeping the North Korean people destitute. If you're destitute, you don't have the means to revolt. And if you don't have the means to revolt, the Kim family is going to stay in power. So I'm afraid that yeah. this message is one which the Kim family does not want to hear. So I've got about 30 seconds. What message does the president then need to project to Kim and his family? in the days ahead in order to get that message you're trying to get across. I think it's what the president just said at the governor's ball. We're going to keep the sanctions on and we're going to even more vigorously enforce those sanctions. You know, we've sort of let up on enforcement over the last eight and a half months. I think the president needs to go back to a much more uh, maximum pressure campaign that we saw at the beginning of 2017, 2018. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Gordon Chang, that's the reason why we had him on live tonight. We appreciate your insight. Thanks very much, Ed. More live coverage from Hanoi in just a moment. The anticipation for this week's summit is palpable right here. I'll take you inside a local barber shop that's actually having a little fun. They're styling customers' hair to look like either Kim Jong-un or President Trump. You'll have to see this to believe it. And next, I'm joined live by Daniel Hoffman. He's about to join President Trump's intelligence advisory board. We'll have his take on the stakes in this week's summit. Our live coverage from Hanoi rolls on. through it. Yeah, I think there are a lot of pundits and a lot of my former colleagues in the intelligence community who would say that it strains the logic that Kim Jong-un would amass this nuclear and ICBM capability and then barter it away for food and energy and a constructive relationship with the international community. But at the end of the day, that's why we're here. It's for the president and his team to ascertain Kim Jong-un's intentions and test them and see where it leads us. So how do you test him? What is most important for President Trump to bring to 2.0. We'll talk about Singapore and what happened there in a moment. But here in Hanoi, what kind? How tough does the president need to be in terms of saying, "Look, Chairman Kim, we had handshakes in Singapore. Now it's time for serious business." Right. I think we're looking for some tangible results. And one area some of the previous guests have focused on is inspections. Uh, we look at the Sohe site, uh, Pungiri, which was uh, the nuclear test facility that the North Koreans. Um, exploded pieces of that in front of journalists. Um, and then we've got Yongbyon, and South Korean government officials have said that, that North Korea is considering closing it. And so I think if Kim Jong un were to admit inspectors into those facilities, that would be a tangible result. As Gordon Chang rightly pointed out, um, an inventory of North Korea's nuclear weapons, an itinerary for their discretion, destruction. Uh, that may be a bridge too far, but it's a starting point for discussion. People don't understand. You told me off air, Yongbyon has over 300 facilities? Almost uh, 300 400, buildings? Yeah, almost 400 buildings. It's over three square miles. Uh, it's used for plutonium uh, development and uranium enrichment. Meaning it would take years to unwind. You don't do this overnight. Right. Arms control experts assess that it might take that long. And so the idea that this would be a step-by-step -step process, and that is something for the president and his team to discuss, is certainly in the realm of the possible here. Finally, it was Winston Churchill who said, Meeting jaw to jaw is better than war. Have the president's critics not given him enough credit for where we are today? The fact that he has, through this relationship building, pulled us back from the brink of nuclear war. Well, I think there's no question that the president has dialed down the temperature on our relationship with North Korea. And without that, you don't have these discussions that are so important taking place right now. And I think the alternative is obviously quite dangerous for the region and the world. And let's see where this takes us. But we're certainly on, I think, at least the right path, having these discussions with, uh, with Kim Jong-un and his Daniel, team. Daniel, we're here. in Singapore together. We'll be here all week with all Bill right. Hammer, Brett Baer, the whole team. It's good to have you on the you ground. Too. All right. Joining me now, Christian Whiten. He's a former State Department senior advisor 
during both the Trump and George W. Bush administrations. He joins us live from Denver. Christian, good to see you, sir. Good to see you, Ed. What would you like to add to this conversation? What, are, what have we not covered yet? Yeah, I think you've covered a great deal and very perceptively. But, um, you know, the thing I would add is just the administration, the White House, is going into this with eyes wide open. You know, I've heard senior officials describe this and when I was in the Trump administration similarly as sort of the least worst option. So there aren't a lot of good options with North Korea that don't carry the risk of a rapid sort of onset of regional war where you could have hundreds of thousands of people dead before leaders even meet to de-escalate. Um, so going mm. into this with a realistic expectation expectation that this is very difficult. But I think coming out of it, if the, it, to the extent Singapore was a meeting of the minds on the end state of a denuclearized North Korea, if this summit can produce a meeting of the minds on how you sequence this, how you get to what we want, which is a uh, handover of nuclear materials, and what they want, which is mm -hmm. sanctions relief and then economic assistance, that would be terrific. And this seems classic Trump, because, Christian, as you rightly point out, you were there at the beginning. And critics were saying when the president was talking about fire and fury that, oh, gosh, the tweets, the nicknames, Little Rocket Man, they, his critics charged that he was, President Trump was, leading us into nuclear war. And quite the opposite has happened, at least so far, in terms of pulling us back from the brink. Talk a little bit about this president's unique approach. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it, it is unique. It's a different twist on, on something that, frankly, Ronald Reagan actually did as well. And people said Reagan was a crazy warmonger when he said that communism was evil, that the Soviet Union was an empire, that history would consign it to the ash heap of history. His own State Department and his own National Security Council didn't want him to go to Berlin and say, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. They thought that was too provocative. Fast forward to our time here, and you have uh, Donald Trump being very blunt in dispensing with the current to see the diplomatic niceties and saying what's on a lot of our minds, um, that plus a just a brilliant multilateral global coalition to put economic pressure on North Korea. Um, you know, a lot of uh, diplomacy still, for some reason, focuses on old Europe, on France and Germany. Well, in the yeah. world we're in today, the countries that matter put a lot of pressure. And then, of course, restoring the military, something Reagan did as well, and Trump by getting that mm -hmm. military budget back over $700 billion. What Reagan called peace through strength, of course. Uh, talk about, I've got a minute left, um, the idea that this president, President Donald J. Trump, may actually officially end the Korean War, that's a possibility, and may pull us back from the brink of nuclear war, as we've been discussing this whole hour. There's been talk that maybe he's going to be up for the Nobel Peace Prize. What do you think about that? <laughs> well, I don't think Trump looks to Europe for uh, to the Nobel Committee for validation. I would be surprised just because, after all, they tend to be very left wing. They gave the prize to Obama even when he had accomplished nothing early in his term uh, and didn't take it away later. Um, I think setting aside whether uh, he gets credentialed or not with, with the foreign policy elite, the real world accomplishment is significant. We've had almost two years, a little less, without right. a North Korean nuclear test or ICBM test. So he has actually changed the world, and it's worth trying this. It's not ideal, but it's worth giving it a shot. Yeah, absolutely. Christian White, we appreciate your insight as well. Thanks for joining Thanks. us. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. The people on the ground here in Vietnam are sadly no strangers to the ravages of war. So it's not unusual to hear outspoken opinions in Hanoi as the city prepares to host these meetings aimed at reducing hostilities in Asia and all around the world. I spoke to one local man among many. This man in particular was an elder. He talked about President Trump and Kim Jong-un taking center stage and what he hopes comes from all this. Watch. What do you think about Donald Trump? Uh, I think he's either very great Great uh, president of American I know before. The American is uh, develop is very 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 high about uh, ec education, about the economic high security. Think they could get a peace deal? I think uh, uh, in Vietnam today, Mr. Kim and Mr. Uh, Kim. Uh, Mr. Kim is uh, uh, is agreed agreed quit the way and uh, hit the peace. For the war. Important to remind ourselves about the stakes. We started with the talk about fire and fury. Now we're talking about the real possibility, and I stress possibility, of peace. An insider's take from the man who once served as the CIA's Deputy Division Chief for Korea, Bruce Klinger. He's going to jo join us live next as our coverage continues in a moment. We're live in Hanoi, Vietnam, where, as I found out today, even crossing the street can be quite an experience.
I was here with President Bush in 2006, and what I remember is, if you keep walking, they'll allow you to walk. But if you stop, you get in trouble. So you have to kind of just keep going around. So I don't know, there's a bus here, there's some mopeds. I think I'm okay. And that's how you do it. And walk through it. Yeah, I think there are a lot of pundits and a lot of my former colleagues in the intelligence community who would say that it strains the logic that Kim Jong-un would amass this nuclear and ICBM capability and then barter it away for food and energy and a constructive relationship with the international community. But at the end of the day, that's why we're here. It's for the president and his team to ascertain Kim Jong-un's intentions and test them and see where it leads us. So how do you test him? What is most important for President Trump to bring to 2.0? We'll talk about Singapore and what happened there in a moment. But here in Hanoi, what kind, how tough does the president need to be in terms of saying, look, Chairman Kim, we had handshakes in Singapore. Now it's time for serious business. Right. I think we're looking for some tangible results. And one area some of the previous guests have focused on is inspections. Uh, we look at the Sohe site, uh, Pungiri, which was uh, the nuclear test facility that the North Koreans um, exploded pieces of that in front of journalists. Um, and then we've got Yongbyon, and South Korean government officials have said that, that North Korea is considering closing it. And so I think if Kim Jong-un were to admit inspectors into those facilities, that would be a tangible result. As Gordon Chang rightly pointed out, um, an inventory of North Korea's nuclear weapons, an itinerary for their discretion, destruction, uh, that may be a bridge too far, but it's a starting point for discussion. People don't understand. You told me off air, Young Bun has over 300 facilities? Almost the 300 400, buildings? Yeah, almost 400 buildings. It's over three square miles. Uh, it's used for plutonium uh, development and uranium enrichment. Meaning it would take years to unwind. You don't do this overnight. Right. Arms control experts assess that it might take that long. And so the idea that this would be a step-by-step -step process, and that is something for the president and his team to discuss, is certainly in the realm of the possible here. Finally, it was Winston Churchill who said, meeting jaw-to-jaw -jaw is better than war. Have the president's critics not given him enough credit for where we are today? The fact that he has, through this relationship building, pulled us back from the brink of nuclear war. Well, I think there's no question that the president has dialed down the temperature on our relationship with North Korea. And without that, you don't have these discussions that are so important taking place right now. And I think the alternative is obviously quite dangerous for the region and the world. And let's see where this takes us. But we're certainly on, I think, at least the right path, having these discussions with, uh, with Kim Jong-un and his Daniel, team. Daniel, we're here. in Singapore together. We'll be here all week with all Bill right, Hammer, Brett Baer, the it. whole team. It's good to have you on the you ground. Too. All right. Joining me now, Christian Whiten. He's a former State Department senior advisor. During both the Trump and George W. Bush administrations, he joins us live from Denver. Christian, good to see you, sir. Good to see you, Ed. What would you like to add to this conversation? What have, what have we not covered yet? Yeah, I think you've covered a great deal and very perceptively. But, um, you know, the thing I would add is just the administration, the White House, is going into this with eyes wide open. You know, I've heard senior officials describe this and when I was in the Trump administration similarly as sort of the least worst option. So there aren't a lot of good options with North Korea that don't carry the risk of a rapid sort of onset of regional war where you could have hundreds of thousands of people dead before leaders even meet to de-escalate. Um, so going mm. into this with a realistic expectation expectation that this is very difficult. But I think coming out of it, if the, it, to the extent Singapore was a meeting of the minds on the end state of a denuclearized North Korea, if this summit can produce a meeting of the minds on how you sequence it, how you get to what we want, which is a uh, handover of nuclear materials, and what they want, which is mm -hmm. sanctions relief and then economic assistance, that would be terrific. And this seems classic Trump, because, Christian, as you rightly point out, you were there at the beginning, and critics were saying when the president was talking about fire and fury that, oh, gosh, the tweets, the nicknames, Little Rocket Man, they, his critics charged that he was, President Trump was, leading us into nuclear war. And quite the opposite has happened, at least so far, in terms of pulling us back from the brink. Talk a little bit about this president's unique approach. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it, it is unique. It's a different twist on, on something that, frankly, Ronald Reagan actually did as well. And people said Reagan was a crazy warmonger when he said that communism was evil, that the Soviet Union was an empire, that history would consign it to the ash heap of history. His own State Department and his own National Security Council didn't want him to go to Berlin and say, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. They thought that was too provocative. Fast forward to our time here, and you have uh, Donald Trump being very blunt in dispensing with the courtesy 
courtesy, the diplomatic niceties and saying what's on a lot of our minds. Um, that plus a just a brilliant multilateral global coalition to put economic pressure on North Korea. Um, you know, a lot of uh, diplomacy still for some reason focuses on old Europe, on France and Germany. Well, in the yeah. world we're in today, the countries that matter put a lot of pressure. And then, of course, restoring the military, something Reagan did as well, and Trump by getting that mm -hmm. military budget back over $700 billion. What Reagan called peace through strength, of course. Uh, talk about, I've got a minute left, um, the idea that this president, President Donald J. Trump, may actually officially end the Korean War. That's a possibility. And may pull us back from the brink of nuclear war, as we've been discussing this whole hour. There's been talk that maybe he's going to be up for the Nobel Peace Prize. What do you think about that? <laughs> well, I don't think Trump looks to Europe for uh, to the Nobel Committee for validation. I would be surprised just because, after all, they tend to be very left wing. They gave the prize to Obama even when he had accomplished nothing early in his term uh, and didn't take it away later. Um, I think setting aside whether uh, he gets credentialed or not with, with the foreign policy elite, the real world accomplishment is significant. We've had almost two years, a little less, without right. a North Korean nuclear test or ICBM test. So he has actually changed the world, and it's worth trying this. It's not ideal, but it's worth giving it a shot. Yeah, absolutely. Christian White, and we appreciate your insight as well. Thanks for joining Thanks. us. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. The people on the ground here in Vietnam are sadly no strangers to the ravages of war. So it's not unusual to hear outspoken opinions in Hanoi as the city prepares to host these meetings aimed at reducing hostilities in Asia and all around the world. I spoke to one local man among many. This man in particular was an elder. He talked about President Trump and Kim Jong-un taking center stage and what he hopes comes from all this. Watch. What do you think about Donald Trump? Uh, I think he's either very great. Great uh, president of American I know before. The American is uh, develop is very 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 high about uh, education, about the economic high security. Think they could get a peace deal? I think uh, uh, in Vietnam today, Mr. Trump and Mr. Kim. Uh, Mr. Kim is uh, uh, is agreed agreed with the way and uh, give the peace. For the war. Important to remind ourselves about the stakes. We started with the talk about fire and fury. Now we're talking about the real possibility, and I stress possibility, of peace. An insider's tape from the man who once served as the CIA's deputy division chief for Korea, Bruce Klinger. He's going to jo join us live next as our coverage continues in a moment. We're live in Hanoi, Vietnam, where, as I found out today, even crossing the street can be quite an experience. I was here with President Bush in 2006, and what I remember is, if you keep walking, they'll allow you to walk, but if you stop, you get in trouble, so you have to kind of just keep going around. So I don't know, there's a bus here, there's some mopeds, I think I'm okay, and that's how you do it.